Last week, we looked at Paul's response to the Corinthians' justification for their continued indulgence in sexual immorality, even after professing faith in Christ. Based upon the claims that Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 13, it would seem that a philosophy of Platonic dualism reigned in Corinth. As we saw last week, this is a philosophy that drove a sharp wedge between the body and the soul, regarding the body as base and temporary and therefore insignificant, and the soul as that which is noble and eternal and therefore significant. It's easy for us to imagine how hedonistic impulses took this philosophy to extremes, teaching that then it really does not matter what one does with the body so long as one cultivates the soul. This platonic dualism eventually found its way into the church. When people are converted to Christ, they don't automatically leave everything that they've learned hitherto at the door. A lot of it has to be deconstructed and reconstructed in, in and under the authority of Scripture. And so this philosophy likewise found its way into the church at Corinth. And the result was a heresy known as Gnosticism, which wreaked havoc in the early centuries of Christian history. Now, I regard the two Corinthian slogans that Paul quotes in verses 12 and 13, the first being, all things are lawful for me, and the second being, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. I, re I, I regard both of those slogans as indicating an incipient form of Gnosticism, or at least a syncretized form of platonic dualism, maybe mixed with a perverse twist on Paul's teaching of freedom from the law. The implication of these slogans is that Christians are free from moral regulations upon the body. All things are lawful for me, they said. And that the bodily appetites are therefore morally neutral and may be freely indulged. Food is for the stomach and the stomach for food. And that the body is temporary and insignificant and therefore so is what one does with the body. And God will destroy both one and the other. The apparent result of this sub-Christian theology was that members of the Corinthian church were engaging in sexual immorality with prostitutes. And so in response to this sub-Christian theology and practice, Paul provides a biblical theology of the body. First, he says that the body is not your master, and you are not to be dominated by its appetites. Rather, you are to bring your body and its appetites under the authority of Christ, to be controlled by the enabling power of the Spirit's grace. Not all things are helpful, says Paul, and I will not be dominated by anything. Second, we saw that Paul says the body was created for God's glory. All of the body's functions and the corresponding appetites were created by God and were declared good. Neither the body nor its appetites are inherently evil or less than the soul. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, Paul says. It's meant for the Lord. He created it for himself. And the Lord is for the body. But though the body and its functions were created good, the result of the fall of man is that the body, and especially its sexual function, is now used for profound evil. Nevertheless, third, the body as well as the soul has been redeemed by the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, with the result that the saint, redeemed by Christ and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, can once again glorify God in the body, which is precisely what Paul commands us to do in verses 19 and 20. And on the last day, Christ will raise both our bodies as well as our souls to glory and immortality. Fourth, just as the redeemed of Christ are uniquely able to glorify God in their body, so they are uniquely able to blaspheme God with their body, which they do. When they take their bodies that are members of Christ and temples of the Holy Spirit, wrench them away from that union and unite them to a prostitute. For the believer in Christ, sexual immorality is blasphemy from which every believer, not only Paul, ought to recoil in disgust. God forbid, verse 15, and from which every believer ought to flee, verse 18. 
That was last week's sermon. Today's passage, we will find, follows a very similar pattern. It begins with a sub-Christian claim made by some in the Corinthian church, which Paul then answers, this time with a brief theology of marriage and the sexual relationship. So once again, we're going to follow the pattern of the passage by looking first at the Corinthians' claim, and then second at the apostles' answer. So we begin with the Corinthians' claim. Once again, we are confronted with a dilemma created by the fact that the original Greek text did not contain punctuation, therefore did not contain quotation marks. Many commentators, and I think they're right, see in verse 1 a quotation from the letter that the Corinthians had earlier written to Paul. Paul writes, now concerning the matters about which he wrote, and here's what they wrote. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. This is not Paul's answer to the Corinthian question. Rather, this is a restatement of the Corinthian question, of the Corinthian opinion that they had written in their letter. Verses 2 through 5 especially, but then the whole of the chapter of 7 is Paul's response. So if we regard this statement of a, as a quotation of a Corinthian claim, then what lies behind this claim? The same thing that lay behind their claims in verses 12 and 13 of chapter 6. It's that platonic dualism. That philosophy that was just breathed in like oxygen in first century Corinth. With its extreme separation of the body and the soul. And its extreme subordination of the body to the soul. You remember that Platonism taught that the body was base, temporal, and therefore insignificant, while the soul was noble and eternal and therefore significant. Hedonism, chapter 6, takes this dualism to sensual extremes. And it's easy to see how that could happen. It's easy to see how the human heart would latch on to Platonism, mix it with a perverse twist on Paul's freedom from the law, and use it as a theological justification for all manner of bodily indulgence. But asceticism takes this Platonic dualism to the other extreme. And it's just as easy to see how the human heart could latch on to Platonism, mix it with Paul's teaching on holiness, and conclude that all bodily appetites are evil and ought to be suppressed. Same philosophy, different direction, equally destructive of the biblical gospel. This ascetic tendency within Christian Theology found its most obvious expression in the monastic movement that began in the third century and continues even today. So what's so dangerous about asceticism? Well, there are two primary problems with the ascetic life. First, it denies the goodness of God's gifts and therefore deprives him of the glory that is owed to him as the giver. Look at what Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. Man, from the way Paul begins there, what horrific heresy, what demonic doctrine do you think he has in mind? You might think he has in mind hedonism of the form that we saw last week, a theology that allows you to indulge the body beyond all moral bounds. To think that you could indulge in sexual immorality, for instance, with the body without imperiling one's immortal soul. But that's not the heresy against which Paul warns in this passage. Let's continue on. Men who forbid marriage... And require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. In other words, the doctrine of demons taught by deceitful spirits is not hedonism. It's asceticism. It's not Eat, drink, and sleep around. It is do not eat, do not drink, 
do not touch. It leads not to gluttony, drunkenness, and sexual immorality. It leads to monasticism. It doesn't create Christians. It creates monks. Celibate monks and celibate nuns who don't eat barbecue. And what does Paul say is wrong with such ascetic laws? It denies the goodness of God's gifts. Here he speaks of food and of the sexual relationship within marriage. And it deprives God of the glory that he ought to receive as the gracious giver of those gifts. When people do not partake of God's good gifts, they do not glorify him or give him thanks. The second problem with asceticism is that it shifts the definition of holiness away from the fruit of the Spirit, particularly love, love for God, love for neighbor. And instead, it defines holiness in terms of extra-biblical laws and external practices. According to asceticism, holiness is denying yourself legitimate pleasures in order to prove your devotion to God. But instead of fostering gratitude to the glory of God, such practices foster self-righteousness. And so Paul resisted asceticism at every turn when it would crop up in the various churches. He wrote to the Colossians, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and the worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. I want you to note, look at this passage, I want you to note how Paul connects asceticism with self-righteousness. They're puffed up without reason. With unbelief, they're not holding fast to the head that is Christ. With division in the church, the whole body nourished and knit together through all its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God, but not if people are dabbling in this nonsense. Evidently, even the Colossians' asceticism coincided with heretical visionary experiences as well that had them worshiping angels. The point is, asceticism is not the gospel, and the holiness it produces is not evangelical, and it's not real. It is an illusion. Back in Corinth, this ascetic strain of thought manifested itself in the belief held by some that sexual relations, even within the covenant of marriage, were evil. They were fleshly. They were unspiritual. They were unsanctified. And judging from the issues that Paul addresses in this chapter, evidently some within the Corinthian church were abstaining from sexual relations within marriage, verse 2. They were even divorcing their spouse in order to pursue a celibate life, verses 10 and 11. Particularly if their spouse was still a pagan when they had been converted to faith in Christ, verses 12 to 16. Others were trying to remain unmarried and celibate, though they evidently did not possess the gift of celibacy, verse 36. But at the root of all of those errant practices was an errant doctrine, a low view of the body and therefore a low view of sex. And before we cast stones, let's recognize what a natural response this is to being converted out of a ferociously licentious, sensual, hypersexualized culture. If your pagan, uh, your former pagan life was marked by sexual immorality and you were converted out of that to faith in Christ, wouldn't it be natural for you to question the sanctity of the sexual act? Even within the covenant of marriage, it's going to give you a bit of whiplash. Wouldn't it be natural for you to associate at a a deeply emotional level the sexual act with feelings of shame? So we can see where they're coming from. This was the case for Augustine, the 4th and 5th century North African bishop and arguably the most important theologian of the church until Luther. When Augustine was 18 years old, he traveled to the bustling North African metropolis of Carthage. He'd already struggled with lust 
for years. But in this city, where all the pleasures of the flesh were readily available, Augustine gave himself over entirely, as he wrote, floundering in the broiling sea of fornication. After a year in Carthage of rampant promiscuity, Augustine took a concubine, whom he kept for over a decade, until an arranged marriage with a woman of high standing forced him to send her away. The terms of the arranged engagement required Augustine to remain chaste for two years before his wedding, a task that Augustine found impossible. So he took another mistress. Writing in his confessions, I thought it should be too miserable unless I was folded into female arms. While struggling over his impending and irresistible conversion, Augustine famously and miserably uttered the prayer, Lord, give me chastity but not yet. For Augustine, conversion entailed the choice between chastity and gaining Christ or losing Christ for the sake of lust. And Augustine chose Christ and celibacy. Augustine wrote much on the subject of sex and marriage and his teaching betrays a decidedly ascetic bent. For Augustine, after the fall of man, the sexual act could not be separated from what he termed concupiscence, or what we would simply call lust. Even within the covenant of marriage, he said, sex was a lustful act and therefore sinful. Therefore, though he held marriage to be an honorable estate, he believed celibacy was far better. And the only acceptable purpose for sex within marriage was procreation. Augustine's low view of sex became the basis for much of the Roman Catholic teaching on the issue that would dominate Christendom for centuries. Now, I have the utmost respect for Augustine. He's he's one of my heroes of the faith. But in this regard, I humbly suggest that he was wrong. I think his immoral past clouded his understanding of the biblical text. And unless I am grossly mistaken, and I'm not... This problem is not isolated to 1st century Corinth or 4th century Carthage. It's a problem many face today, and it can lead to all manner of sexual dysfunction within Christian marriage. We need a biblical theology of the body and a biblical theology of sex and marriage. We focused on the former last week. We're going to focus on the latter this week. So how does the apostle respond to this encroaching asceticism within the church at Corinth? Well, in chapter 7, Paul's going to have a whole lot to say on the subject of marriage, and we're going to take several weeks on it, both at the end of December and into the new year. But let's focus our attention this morning on verses 1 to 9 and the sexual relationship within marriage. In this passage, we find five truths about sex, marriage, and the relationship between the two. Number one, Paul admits that sexual immorality is an imminent threat to Christians living in a fallen world. Look at verse 2. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. In other words, one reason the philosophy of asceticism fails as a philosophy of the Christian life is because of the reality of sexual immorality and the imminent threat that it poses to the Christian life. Just because you choose to become a monk and cloister yourself in a monastery somewhere doesn't mean you're not going to burn with lust. (laughs) Luther, who tried it, remarked once that he he went into the Augustinian monastery in order to try to escape from Satan, but he found that, that the devil came in right with him. Paul's argument here presupposes two important truths. First, sexual immorality is a grave sin to be avoided at all costs. As we saw last week, it is bodily blasphemy. It is blasphemy to take your body redeemed by Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, a body that is united to Christ, and then to take it and unite it with a prostitute or a girlfriend or boyfriend. The loving sexual union between husband and wife within the covenant of marriage is an analogy 
of the intimate spiritual union between Christ and his church within the new covenant, but the lustful sexual union between a man and a prostitute or a boyfriend and girlfriend, particularly when engaged in by Christians united to Christ in the new covenant, thoroughly defiles that analogy and blasphemes Christ and the new covenant. And God is the avenger of such things. Hebrews 13, 4, let marriage be held in honor by all. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Chapter 6 and verse 9, the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. Therefore, verse 18, flee from immorality at all costs. But second, the temptation to sexual immorality is nearly universal. This is also implied by verse 2. My argument flows like this. If marriage is a God-given remedy for sexual temptation, as Paul says in verse 2, and if marriage, as I will argue momentarily, is the normative estate for mankind, then the sexual temptation or the temptation to sexual immorality must likewise be normative. Let me run you through that logic again. If marriage is a, not the, but a, God-given remedy for sexual temptation, and if marriage is the normative estate for mankind, such that celibacy is the special gift, not marriage, then the temptation to sexual immorality must likewise be normative. Are there exceptions? Of course. We live in a fallen world in which every facet of creation has suffered corruption, the sexual function included. There are those who, for physiological reasons and psychological reasons, seem immune from sexual temptation. But that's not the norm. It may not be every man's battle, but it is for most men and women. Note that Paul does not limit sexual temptation to men. He extends it equally to women. Not only does he say in verse 2 that each woman should have her own husband, but in verses 3 and 4 he makes a point of saying that neither spouse should deprive the other of sexual intimacy. As I mentioned last week, one of my criticisms of the 90s purity culture is that it gave the impression that sexual temptation was stronger in men than it was in women, and therefore it placed inequitable responsibility upon the woman to maintain the physical boundaries. I just think that's a simplistic way of looking at the differences between men and women. Yes, sexual temptation manifests itself in different physiological and psychological forms in men versus women, but it is a real danger for both men and women. And we would do well to acknowledge it as such and to prepare both men and women to face it down and to stand firm against it. And one of the God-given means of doing so is procuring a sexually faithful, sexually fulfilling marriage. Which brings me to the second truth of Paul's theology of sex and marriage. Marriage is a God-given remedy for sexual temptation. Let's read verses 2 through 5. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, And likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by mutual agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. In other words, in the face of sexual temptation... Get married. But in other passages where Paul warns against sexual temptation, Paul simply commands self control. For instance, 1 Thessalonians 4. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body, literally possess his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. In the face of sexual temptation, grow up, Paul says. Learn how to act like a saint of the Holy One rather than as a Gentile who's, who's tossed to and fro by his bodily passions. So which one is it? Why does Paul tell the Thessalonian church that the remedy for sexual immorality is self-control, the fruit of the Spirit? And the Corinthian church that the remedy for sexual immorality is marriage. 
Well, what does that tell you? It tells me that the two remedies are not mutually exclusive. Both are good, and in most cases, both will be necessary. As I said last week, marriage is not the first line of defense against lust. Self-control is. If you do not learn self-control before marriage, your lust will wreck your marriage. Marriage does not solve the problem of lust. Now, we will work out some of the implications of verse 2 momentarily, but this passage goes a little bit further. It says something more than just get married in order to avoid sexual immorality. If marriage is a God-given remedy to sexual immorality, if it's a God-given guard against sexual temptation, then sex within marriage must be designed for more than procreation. It must be designed for satisfaction. Otherwise, how would it guard against sexual immorality? The power of sexual temptation is not that it carries within it the potential for procreation. If anything, that's a deterrent to sexual immorality. No, the temptation of sexual immorality, the power of that temptation lies in its promise of satisfaction, its promise of pleasure, a promise that it ultimately fails to deliver in the long run. Therefore, if the sexual relationship within marriage is going to be an effective God-given defense against sexual immorality, it must be designed for satisfaction. It is the satisfaction of the marriage bed that guards against looking for satisfaction elsewhere. That seems to me to be Paul's argument. And it seems to me that that of itself is enough to destroy Augustine's argument that sex cannot be separated from lust and therefore the only proper purpose of sex within marriage is to bear children. The sexual relationship within marriage is meant to be enjoyed. It is a good gift of a good God that is meant to be received with thanksgiving because it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. 1 Timothy 4, 4 and 5. Third, Paul argues that marriage is the normative estate for Christian men and women. Again, note verse 2. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Each man, each woman should have his or her own spouse. In other words, each man and each woman should be married. There's a caveat coming, you, you know, but that's the norm. So this point requires some explanation. So let me add a few notes. I give them there to you in your bulletin outline. First, marriage is not a command such that to remain unmarried is sin. This is not the only verse on marriage in the Bible. It's not the only verse on marriage in the chapter. It's not the only verse on marriage in this passage. So let's not treat it as such. Marriage is not a command such that to remain unmarried is sin. That was the way the Jews of Paul's day regarded marriage, based upon their rabbinic interpretation of the creation mandate. Genesis 2.18 says, it is not good for man to be alone. And they said, therefore, it's sin for man to be alone. If God commanded the man and the woman to be fruitful and multiply, if therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, then it must be God's will for every man to marry, or so they reasoned. The Jewish Mishnah required Jewish men to marry and beget children, and the Jewish Talmud pronounces repeated curses upon those who did not. It's unlikely that Paul was never married. How could a man who described himself as, to the law, a Pharisee, as to righteousness under the law, blameless, a man who described himself as advancing in Judaism beyond many of his own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers, Philippians 3, Galatians 1. How could he say that if he had not obeyed the fundamental command to marry as it was understood by first century Judaism? If he was indeed a member of the Sanhedrin, as is often supposed, then he was certainly married because that was absolutely required. Now, whether he was widowed or perhaps even divorced on account of his conversion to Christ, maybe 1 Corinthians 7.15 is autobiographical. Or by some special providence, 
I'm wrong in the supposition that Paul had at one point been married and he had remained unmarried his whole life. It's clear that he's unmarried at the time he writes 1 Corinthians. And that fact that he repeatedly exhorts those who can to remain unmarried for the purpose of undivided devotion to the Lord makes it abundantly clear that marriage is not a command and to remain unmarried is not sin. Second, all things considered, marriage is not even the preferable estate in this age. Look at some of the statements Paul makes in this chapter. Verse 6, Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I am, unmarried. Verse 9, To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. Verse 26, I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. And I take present distress to be a reference to the present age of tribulation between the first and second comings of Christ, the age that the New Testament labels the last days. And I think this becomes clear a few verses later. Verse 28, but if you do marry, you have not sinned, yet those who do marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. Verse 31, for the present form of the world is passing away. So he's thinking of the imminent return of Christ. Look at verse 32. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife and his interests are divided. And the unmarried and unbetrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Verse 38, so then he who marries his betrothed does well, but he who refrains from marriage will do even better. Paul could not be clearer. Celibate singleness is the preferred state in these last days, this present age of tribulation. Nevertheless, third, celibacy is bounded by a special gift of God such that only those who have the gift should remain single. Verses 6 and 7, now as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Only those who have been granted by God the gift of celibacy should pursue celibacy. All others should pursue marriage. So how do you know if you have the gift of celibacy, the gift of singleness? It would appear that one evidence is that you are able to exercise extraordinary self-control over your sexual desires. You don't, as Paul says in verse 9, burn with passions. To the unmarried and the widows I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. It's not the only evidence, but it's one evidence Another might be that in your state of singleness, you simply don't feel lonely. You don't feel an intense longing for companionship. You've been gifted to an extraordinary degree with the companionship of Christ and His church. But more on that in a moment. Fourth, the Corinthian claim then that Paul quotes in verse 1 and the philosophy that undergirds it is false. Celibacy may be the preferred state in view of the tribulation of this age and the imminent return of Christ, but it is not a more spiritual state, a holier state than marriage because it is given as a free and sovereign gift. Celibacy or singleness. I'm using those two words interchangeably. I don't want to just say singleness in this culture because a lot of people willingly may remain single but they in no way, shape, or form remain celibate. In the Bible, if you're going to remain single, you've got to remain celibate. So the two go together. But the reason that celibacy is not a more spiritual state than marriage is because celibacy is given as a sovereign gift of the sovereign spirit. 
celibacy is no more holy than marriage than speaking in tongues is more holy than prophecy or teaching. They're spiritual gifts. And 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So if you don't have the gift, that's no sin. Get married. Those who are celibate are not more spiritual than those who marry. What they are is less encumbered by the cares of this world, more free to live in undivided devotion to God, and marriage is certainly preferable to sexual immorality, as Paul has made clear. The implication, finally, is that all Christians who do not possess the gift of celibacy should pursue marriage. Paul would seem to suggest that you must not underestimate the power of sexual temptation, nor should you overestimate the strength of your own Self-control. God has given marriage as a remedy against sexual temptation. Use it in the fight for purity. Now, I'll say something here. I, pure, I criticized purity culture last week for pushing unprepared young men and young women into early marriages for which they were not emotionally or financially or otherwise ready. And I said that the first line of defense against sexual temptation is not marriage, it is self-control, citing 1 Thessalonians 5, 3 through 5, and its command that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor and not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. I'll say it again, marriage is not the cure for lust. If you do not learn self-control before marriage, it will wreck your marriage after by the unrestrained power of your fleshly passions. But marriage is a God-given weapon in the fight against sexual temptation. And if you do not possess the gift of celibacy, you should employ it. So this week provides a necessary addendum to last week. Last week I said, do not imagine that marriage is the first line of defense against lust. Learn self-control. This week I'm saying, but do not neglect the weapon of marriage in your fight against lust. Find a suitable candidate and marry. Those two statements are not contradictory. They're complementary. Fourth, sexual intimacy within marriage is good and necessary. Let's look at both of those descriptions. First, sexual intimacy within marriage is good. By that I mean two things. On the one hand, I mean it is not sin. It is, in fact, holy. It is not unspiritual. It is not fleshly. It is not a necessary evil. It is not antithetical to the spiritual disciplines such that one must abstain from the former in order to effectively participate in the latter. Even Paul's concession in verse 5 that married couples may fast, as it were, from sexual intimacy by mutual consent for the purpose of prayer does not imply that sex and prayer are antithetical to one another any more than food and prayer are antithetical to one another. One fasts from food in order to remind oneself that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, in order to remind ourselves that we dare not become so enamored of God's good gifts that we neglect to glorify the giver. One fasts from food in order to remind one's flesh that it can't have everything it wants as soon as it wants it. The spirit is master of the flesh, not the other way around. But one does not need to fast in order to pray. In fact, fasting is the extraordinary state. Eating is the normative state. And prayer is to be continual. Which means that most of your prayer is going to take place when you are not fasting. So there must not be any antithetical relationship between food and prayer. I would say the same thing is true. The same logic applies to fasting from sex. A couple may choose to fast from sexual intimacy for a time for the purpose of heightening the intimacy of prayer because fasting from sex serves the same two purposes. It reminds oneself that life is more than sex, that we dare not neglect the giver by an inordinate focus upon his gifts, and it reminds one's flesh that it can't have everything that it wants as soon as it wants it. 
The spirit is master of the flesh, not the other way around. But fasting from sex is clearly, according to Paul, the extraordinary state. Regular sexual intimacy within marriage is the ordinary state. And prayer is to be continual, which means that most prayer takes place when a married couple is not fasting from sexual intimacy. The Christian view of sex should, should create no emotional or spiritual whiplash between sexual intimacy and prayer. You ought to be able to move directly from the marriage bed to the prayer closet without confessing sin or experiencing shame. Second, by saying that sexual intimacy within marriage is good, I also mean that it's given for pleasure as well as for procreation. I argued for this point earlier, but let me take it from a different angle here. It is telling, is it not, that Paul does not say that sexual intimacy within marriage should be frequent because how else will children come into the world? He doesn't argue pragmatically for the goodness of sex within marriage because of sex's relationship to procreation. He argues for the goodness of sex within marriage because of its relationship to pleasure. Otherwise, as I argued above, it would not serve as an effective deterrent to sexual temptation. Sexual pleasure within the holy covenant of marriage is a good gift from a good God. And marriage is its proper, its only proper domain for expression. Now there's more that could be said on that point, but it'll have to wait for another time and setting. Now by saying that sexual intimacy within marriage is necessary, I also mean two things. First, I mean that sexual intimacy within marriage is ordinarily necessary to sexual purity, which is the main point of Paul's argument in this text. If you have the gift of celibacy, you possessed by virtue of that gift extraordinary self-control. If you do not possess extraordinary self-control, if you are prone to burn with passion, verse 9, then you do not have the gift of celibacy and you should marry. And in your marriage, you should engage in frequent sexual intimacy, verse 5, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So frequent sexual intimacy within marriage is ordinarily necessary to the sexual purity of both the husband and the wife. But by saying that sexual intimacy within marriage is necessary, I also mean that it is ordinarily necessary to marital health. Now, this is not Paul's primary concern in 1 Corinthians 7, so I'm not going to try to make a point from 1 Corinthians 7, or I'd be twisting his words here. But it is implicit in the biblical teaching on marriage, which Paul affirmed and echoed elsewhere in his writings. The one flesh union is vital to the marriage covenant established in Genesis 2, a covenant that reflects the new covenant between Christ and his bride, which is the church, Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, that we read at the beginning of this service. And that new covenant relationship between Christ and his bride, the church, is a relationship marked by intimate union and fullness of joy. In other words, arguing backwards then from the new covenant to the marriage covenant, if our relationship with Christ is neither cold nor distant, then neither should our relationship be between husband and wife. Now again, the specifics of what it means for sexual intimacy in marriage to be frequent and pleasurable, we'll have to wait for another time and setting. But the general teaching is clear enough. Are there exceptions? Can you have a healthy marriage without sexual intimacy due to some physical handicap or emotional trauma? Yes, but those are the exceptions. They are not the norm, and they should be handled on a case-by-case basis. As the normative expectation, married couples of First Baptist Nixa hear the word of the Lord. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights. Literally, he should pay the debt. Likewise also the woman to her husband, for the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not, some translations would suggest, stop depriving one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, so that you may devote yourself to prayer. But then, 
Come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. In other words, what does holiness within marriage in this regard look like? Well, what does all holiness look like? Love one another. Husbands and wives, sexually. Finally, celibacy is a gift to be cherished in the church. Verse 6. Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind, one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Verse 26, I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Verse 38, so then he who marries his betrothed does well, but he who refrains from marriage will do even better. Just look at those statements. It is all too common for singles today to treat singleness as a curse. And it is all too common for churches today to inadvertently reinforce that perspective by asking singles, have you met someone yet? I notice so-and-so over there is single. Maybe I should introduce you. Nudge, nudge. What are you waiting for? Go find a man. Go find a woman. Now, I know that such statements that come from married people come from those who enjoy their marriage and they see their spouse as a blessing from God and they want that for someone else. And that's good. I certainly don't want married people viewing their spouse as a curse. But it is exceedingly rare for singles to hear from those who are happily single and celibate. So hear from Paul, who was single, celibate, and extraordinarily happy. Even when we read such statements from Paul, I think our tendency is to say, well, that's, that's Paul. He's probably unmarried because no woman would have him. If he were married, he wouldn't say things like that. But as I said earlier, it's probable Paul had been married at one point. Furthermore, do you ever get the idea that Paul was lonely? Do you, do you get the impression that he was sitting around pining for a wife? He had Christ. He had intimacy with Christ That was to such a degree that marriage would have paled in comparison and indeed would have gotten in the way. Sorry, Lord, I can't be caught up to the third heaven tonight. I've got to spend time with my wife. Now, Paul recognizes that singleness, celibacy, is a gift that most in the church do not possess. But he earnestly wants those who are single to consider whether or not they may have it. Even further, he wants those who are single to hope that they have it. Why? Because it's better. Now, don't hear that as a slight against marriage. Paul is not anti-marriage. He wants marriages to be holy and happy. But what must the gift of singleness be like if it's better than marriage? The gift of celibacy is not a curse. It's a blessing. It is not a life sentence to loneliness and sexual frustration. It comes with an attendant promise of sufficient grace and intimacy with Christ such that at the end of your life and redounding throughout eternity, you will say, I lacked nothing. I was of all men, of all women most blessed. Let me quickly conclude this sermon with three brief applications. First, Prevent immorality at all costs. Do whatever it takes. Do not underestimate its seductive power. Do not underestimate the weakness of your flesh. Do not give lust any quarter in your life. Put it to death. Learn self-control, which begins, Romans 13, 14, by making no provision for the flesh. If you're an alcoholic, don't step foot in a liquor store. And if you're a man or woman without the gift of celibacy, don't put yourself in a compromising situation with a person or a television or a computer or a phone or a book. The cost of sexual immorality is too high. Don't pay it. It is a plague that will take your life and destroy your soul, so treat it as such. Second, if you are single and do not possess the gift of celibacy, 
then pursue marriage. It is no sin more than that. It's good. He who finds a wife finds a what? A good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Now be cautious. Seek wise counsel. Heed that counsel. But don't be too picky. Don't fall for the myth of the one. You know, if I'm waiting for the one. Find a godly man, find a godly woman to whom you are physically and emotionally attracted and pursue marriage under God. More on this in a coming sermon. And if you're married, act like it. Frequently. For the sake of the holy pleasure of your spouse whom God has given you. Finally, if you are single, pray for the gift of celibacy. Believe that it is better than marriage. And then if the Lord says no, pray for a spouse, if that's your desire. But I think what I'm asking you to do, singles, is explore celibacy as an option. An option that comes not with the curse of lifelong loneliness and sexual frustration, but with the promise of sufficient grace and superior joy.